I am resident of Collinwood for YouTube. Back with the author of the Dark Shadows Day book, Patrick McCray. We're here to talk about 1776 and its comparison to, well, Dark Shadows. Patrick, I will say this, that you had touched upon before about how the old house was probably more built for strategic position and defense. Yeah. And yeah. it's so, that's something I picked up right away with this movie is as they're prepared, like, because, you know, Adams is pushing for this, you know, he wants independence. Yeah. And so I kept, every time I see, you know, William Daniels <laughs> and hear his voice, I keep seeing the old house for some reason. That's interesting. I mean, but it all fits together. It's, you know, the 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 costumes and and the general flavor of the era and so on are all consistent. And it wouldn't surprise me if the costumes were rented from some of the same places. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I mean, there are definite differences between 1770s fashion and 1790s fashion. There's a lot of overlap, too. I really like how this starts, too, because I'd never, you'd asked me if I'd seen it, and I hadn't. Mm -hmm. So, and the one thing is, when I see a movie, I, d I try to see no previews at all, because I want to be surprised <laughs> if there is any. Did and the version you see, did it start with opening credits kind of over sort of a just a, a long panning shot of a drawing of the era? Or did it go right into John Adams at the bell? Because there are two different cuts. Well, I did. I will say this. I rented the director's cut. It went into John Adams. OK, great. Then you saw the you saw the real thing. Okay. Um, it, it was really which that sort of I guess that's the reason why it did that because of it being the director's cut, because that usually when you do see some movies that does usually some movies do start off with credits. Mm -hmm. But I like how they did this. I. I I'm glad I got to watch it this way as opposed to the other way. Yeah, the the story of the the actual release of the film is pretty pretty curious because it uh, they had a full length version of it, and I guess the studio wanted it to be a little shorter, maybe get in more screenings per day. But the big thing is the Jack Warner was very conservative, and there were elements about the founding fathers that the play brings up that he did not want in there. And rumor has it that he was kind of urged on by Nixon to cut certain things. So the conservatives actually have a main number. It's a big epic number called Cool, Cool Conservative Men. Do you remember that? John Dickinson sings it. Come ye cool, cool conservative men. Okay, uh, that was cut. And most of the film elements were lost until the late 90s or early aughts. Now, this is a movie that came out, you know, 1971, I think, 1972. Uh, and so think about that stretch of time. And, and film historians really had to dig around to find the elements that they could find. There was a prestigious uh, laser disc of it that came out at one point that had these elements, but they were really scratched up. No one thought they would get uh, the version that you saw in such a pristine, completely restored fashion. But for years, all people had was this truncated, or perhaps trumpeted, uh, version of of the story. We, we also get two Dark Shadows cast members in this movie, which is really cool. I love Virginia... Uh, yeah. Her singing... It was really good. I had never got, we never got to hear her sin in Dark Shadows, but she really nails it here. It underlines how talented and multi talented the Dark Shadows cast members really are. I mean, I, I suspect that for most people going into show business back then, singing was a prerequisite. I tell you, I got into trouble, sort of trouble, uh, with Marie Wallace before I interviewed her because she had been in so many musicals, I assumed that she could sing. Yeah. And I wanted to ask her questions about that. And she, you know, very politely but firmly said that she was not primarily a singer. And uh, and and 
so but I think she might be an exception. I think I think most of them could could sing. And of course, David Ford is absolutely a powerhouse and seems much younger and more fit and vigorous as uh, as John Hancock than he does as, uh, you know, any of his characters on Dark Shadows. Yeah, he really seemed revitalized in this movie a lot. I mean, he, he, it's not just his face, his, you notice, really it's his voice. And then when he gets the same too, it's wonderful. It The musical notes in this movie are spot on. They're really well done. Yeah, I'm not entirely certain about Sherman Edwards' background, but I think he, he wrote pop songs and mm-hmm. things like that. And he was also a history teacher. But this was his his it really is only musical uh and what an accomplished musical it is considering that they sort of do bring up things about the forefathers each to each other in, in the congress of the because they're arguing over this you, mm-hmm. have, you know pennsylvania they're arguing against um independence and there are other states the southern states are arguing against independence and when they have thomas jefferson write the decoration or you know john adams is choosing him because he thinks they'll run the pens right through it which is a good musical number i like the fact that thomas jefferson i haven't seen my life i haven't seen. it's all true sherman yeah. edwards took all of that from letters and and other documents uh the songs really between john adams and his wife played by virginia vestoff uh i believe you know most of the lyrics are taken from letters that they had. Um, and, and you know, I remember uh, I had always heard of this show and I had avoided it because, I, Jewel, you weren't born in 19, by 1976. You still had a few years to come, I believe. Yeah. Well, I was born in 71, so I was five years old. I was old enough to be aware of the bicentennial and there is bicentennial crap everywhere. And and by crap, I literally mean you know cookie containers. I mean they exploited the the the, the daylights out of this, and um, and I remember it seemingly being this very kind of sanitized event, and that I was supposed to really like as a five year old, but I had no idea what the big deal was, and so I avoided the movie, thinking it was going to be this you know, very, uh, very kind of sanitized Disney thing. And the thing that amazed me when I saw the film, and now keep in mind, I've directed the play twice. So I've, I've become pretty intimate with it. And, and I've, I've been in it once and I'll, I'll let you guess what the character was. But, um, when I saw it for the first time, the thing that amazed me was how human it made these guys and how, complex their humanity made an event that I think most of us kind of take for granted that they all thought, geez, we just need to have independence. Come on guys, let's sign this thing and get on with it. Um, you know, Washington's chomping at the bit, but we can't tell the difference between his teeth and the bit. Anyway, um, the, the, that to me really remains the amazing part. And that despite they're human foibles. Yeah. They they pull it off. I think it was really interesting to hear how, you know, North Carolina and had when they heard about, you know, they said, No, 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 you're not including you're not including freeing the slaves. And it's like, wow, it's it, it's like all this and you know, you're gonna cut co- you could cost this country independence. If you, it's when, like amazing. When, yeah, when people want to get down on Thomas Jefferson, you know, this is the thing that that shows. No, slavery was very important to these guys uh, in terms of the the creation of the Declaration of Independence. Slavery was the the abolition of slavery was very important to the concept of the founding of the country. But if this, you know, there would have been no America to free slaves. Right. Now, the interesting question is, I don't know what the what the timeline of slavery in England was and what the, I, I've never heard about a lot of slavery in England, but 
they were a part of England and they had slavery in America, so there had to be some relationship with it. I don't really know what the timeline is on that, but uh, but you know, I think a lot of the the message that I think Franklin has for Adams is, you know, what are your priorities? Right. We got to have an America first, right. and then deal with the other stuff, or we're going to lose everything. Um, Do you think Benjamin Franklin being able to reach John Adams? helped him you know realize okay yeah you're right you know sure i mean franklin is kind of the soul of the play he's the conscience of the play and you know but franklin also doesn't have to make the tough calls and franklin doesn't have to face the consequences of those tough calls Mm -hmm. so it it really rests on adams to get over himself and you know one of the things that i think in modern terms especially given the events of the past couple of weeks that are so important that, that are reflected in the play is that in, in the, and in the movie is that you, you, you see um, people who are willing to cut off their nose to spike their face. They're willing to have one clause and God knows I'm not the, I'm not going to ever say that an anti-slavery clause was minor or unimportant. And it was one part of a number of revolutionary acts, but uh, hang everything on one element of a much larger piece and everything gets lost and everything gets given up for that one piece. Um, And so here's the question. Do you compromise like John Adams did? Or do you hold firm? Because I think one of the things that we have seen with uh, the Democrats, I think, uh, you know, is is on one hand, you know, absolutely no no compromise on on certain things, and then at the same time, uh, they get completely you know hornswoggled into all sorts of things that are not really in their best interest by the Republicans. And um, that, to me, has been a very complicated dance to see. When do you bend? Right. When do you hold firm? And if the play says anything, it says, that's a really tough question. It's a question we just have to keep asking. There's, I think, with history, not just U.S. history, but other history, politics it's it's not always it's sometimes it's who benefit who benefits from it most but sometimes there's an overall beneficial like with the declaration of independence i would probably now as far as individual i would say when julius caesar was assassinated by brutus to me brutus did nothing wrong he had the least to gain he didn't have as much as the gain as the other guys in the room did yeah But with the Declaration of Independence, it's like, okay, you need a country here, and then you can settle this matter later on. If we don't compromise here, we're not going to have a country, and England's going to come in and just roll over us here. Yeah, uh, you know, the. have you ever seen the, the HBO miniseries John Adams with Paul Giamatti? No. It's great. It's a good compliment to this because it shows how brutal uh, British rule could really be. It it was not, you know, tea and crumpets. Uh, and um, and there was a need to to break with that brutality um, urgently. I'll tell you this. When I was in fifth grade history class, my former history teacher, Mr. Elias, he, he won't. It's not like he's watching this, but shout out to him anyway. Oh, he but, will be now. I'll but, make sure of it. And he so, saw what you did. Go on. The one thing he got across to us as a classroom was how how violent the British were to the Boston natives. And, you know, the Boston Massacre where, the, the, where the, the, they threw snowballs and when they yelled fire, he really painted that picture of the the 
the the British troops firing on unarmed civilians, and he he painted it very vividly, and I because I could see this in my mind as he was talking, and he said they murdered these people, and it's like my God. Yeah, uh, you know the and the movie seventeen seventy six makes a point of this, which is how bleak the prospect of victory was, yeah. but the price of going along with British rule was even bleaker. Yeah. I mean, look, most countries eventually fight for independence, right? But with this, the British, when you tell somebody once upon a time, the British had the biggest Navy, the best Navy, the best army, people just raise their eyebrows at you, but they did. Yeah. And they were... In many ways, they were what Rome used to be. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah. Rome had roads. The yep. England had had the oceans. Yep, and they they were very smart. They had very smart generals, you know. And here's Washington. He has a militia of untrained fighters, and it really the French the the French. Uh, I don't know if he was a general who taught the soldiers how to fight. The foot, I think it was his name. Who? I forget what was his name. La foot or something. I'm Lafayette, probably... maybe. Lafayette, yeah. Yeah, Lafayette. Sorry, but he he doesn't get it. Well, he does get good a lot of credit, but he to me he never gets enough credit because he taught those soldiers how to shoot and fight. You know. Mm-hmm. What well, and seventeen? I know seventeen seventeen seventy six doesn't get into that, but because again, that's it's pre war. But again, I do love the fact that this movie does. John Adams painted the same picture my history teacher painted to me. Okay. I, could, I could see it. You know, I could mm -hmm. see what John Adams was saying because I could remember Mister Elias's words to. To me when I was a lot younger it really it's very it was a very violent time for Massachusetts and it, what John Adams is trying to say is hey I'm not going to be the only one if we let this continue that's what John Adams was really saying and he was right and and progress sometimes really and you know this is something that both sides of the political aisle can claim but progress sometimes really takes someone willing to be uh, unpopular, yeah, in certain ways, and and that's the that's the dangerous thing, and and dangerous in both senses, risky, and yeah, it can be a real danger. I think, and you know, again, I'm I'm no John Adams, and I'm not in his head or anything, but I think the one thing I've always learned from Ad, Adam from hearing about John Adams throughout history was. John, no one had to tell John Adams he could be Hun. He knew that, you know? Yeah. I think that's the one thing I take away most from history is John Adams, he, he realized that fact. He knew he could be Hun, but he, he was seeing his people, you know, his fellow Massachusetts, be killed. Yeah. And it's something he wasn't going to stand for. Adams, you're right, he was... To a lot of the Congress, he was somebody they didn't like, or the villain, if you will, to them. But in many ways, hey, guess what? I'm dealing with a bigger villain. Yeah. You think I'm bad? <laughs> Wait till George George gets there. Well, and the 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 real idea that you had a split between people who saw themselves as creatures of a new nation yeah. and people who saw themselves as as English citizens. How how important? I know this is gonna. How important was it for John Adams to realize he couldn't write the Declaration? He had to get someone else for the for the plot of the story. Right. I mean, because historically, I don't really know. Um, but for the plot of the story, uh, am I developing a lazy eye? Good lord. Anyway, I'm gonna put these back on. Uh, for the plot of the story, it's incredibly important. Uh, he has to have other characters to bounce off of. Mm -hmm. It it can't just be a monologue. No, <laughs> where he's he's inventing all of America single handedly. 
you know, there's a great, great line where, uh, uh, you know, it, they talk about how long is it going to take a week? And Adam says, you know, good Lord, a week, the whole earth was created in a week. And Jefferson says, well, someday you must tell me how you did it. Uh, so, um, so yeah. And, and, and I think it illustrated because a, it happened. So it has to be in the story, but, uh, you know, Jefferson is a is a weird reflector character for Adams, and you realize who they are. Yeah. Who the three? There, you when you have Adams, who's the man of action, yeah. he's something of an intellectual, but he's also very much a rebel. Yeah. You have the strong rebel of Doctor Franklin, yeah. and then you have uh, Jefferson who can do everything well, is tall, thin, and immediately portrayed as a scientist, you realize you have Kirk, Spock, and McCoy. Yeah. Yep. You really do. You have the same triumvirate of, of that's, in, that's in Star Trek. You have Kirk, Spock, and McCoy. You do. I really th- like the fact that when they're outside his, his apartment or whatever, outside Jefferson's apartment, and Adams is saying to uh, Dr. Franklin, he's saying, you'll, you'll be remembered in history because you invent things. He goes, they're not going to remember me. They're not going <laughs> to like, He didn't know he was going to be president. Right, right. Like, these guys, our, our founding fathers were definitely not clairvoyants. No, they weren't. <laughs> But, but they they really they lived the moments and yeah. they live you know John Adams lived the terror of Massachusetts his people dying Benjamin Franklin you know he he knew it as well he knew he it's really and I love I love uh, David Ford's portrayal of John Hancock it was really well done. I mean, everybody just, it reminded me of Dark Shadows. Everyone sold their ass off, and they did a wonderful job. Well, yeah, not only that, but one of the things that I love about this is that, um, let me let me do a little, let me just try a quiz on something. Okay. Which one was Caesar Rodney? Hmm. Oh, Which gosh. one was Caesar Rodney? Do you remember? Okay. Which one was John, the Reverend John Witherspoon? I forget the actor, but he was... Um, Don't worry about the actor. Think about the character with the okay. same thing with Caesar Rodney. I think John Witherspoon was very tall, if I remember correctly. He was. Does he come in at the beginning of the play, or does he come in in the middle of Act 1? I believe he comes in the middle. Bang. You got it. Uh, uh, Caesar Rodney, who uh, he's a he's a little guy, yeah. and we see him with Thomas McKeon. Colonel Thomas McKeon. Do you rem- do you remember anything about about say Caesar Rodney? You can say no. It's okay. No, I'm, I'm trying to. I explore. don't really because again. Caesar Rod, I, I remember him sitting next to somebody. I remember okay. that, and that's okay. Uh, one last, one last question. Um, uh, Stephen Hopkins of Rhode Island. Do you remember him? <laughs> I'll give you one, one sentence. McNair. <laughs> you remember that guy? Give me the rum. Is that the rum guy? Yeah, that's the rum guy. Okay, so um, and let's try. Let's just try one more, because because we got we got it going on. Uh, Judge Wilson, also of Pennsylvania. <laughs> the pro the problem with the Pennsylvania guys, both of them, uh huh, they're kissing each other's ass. Okay? They are. Who was who was mainly kissing the ass of the other one? You have between Judge Dick Wilson, Wilson was Judge Wilson was kissing the ass of the other guy. Yeah. How many times have you seen this movie? Once. Once. Okay. These are for one thing. There are a ton of characters in this thing, 
and having only seen it once, you did a very good job at identifying certain key elements of these characters. And that just goes to show the strength of the acting and the strength of the writing that in just a few sentences, you know everything you need to know about these characters. And that's a tremendous feat to pull off. I can't, I've seen the Eternals. I can't tell you anything about any of them. Uh, you know, and yet that's a Marvel movie where, but, but 1776, bang, right on right on the money. And think of, think of how Dark Shadows does the same thing. Yeah. Ton of characters you have to keep track of, but it portrays them so clearly, it's no problem. I think that's what happens when you have excellent writing and you have actors who are so talented, they pull it off. Absolutely. And they they know they're not just speaking to themselves; they're literally speaking to their audience, and that's how you remember them. And the one thing I'll say about this movie too is. It, yes, it's a musical, but the words within the music and the, even the words that aren't in the music are just as important as the words that are in the music. That's the one thing about a musical that's so great. Look at The Wizard of Oz. Same thing. A good musical, definitely. And in this, nothing is wasted. Yeah. Uh, and although, here's something, here's something cool. As a musical, it is... Um, it has the longest non-musical sequence in any musical ever written. 20 minutes. Wow. It goes 20 minutes. And at that point, I think you realize when it's, when it's willing to just tell the story with words for that long, one of the cool tricks is that the show becomes completely unpredictable at that point. Yeah. As like, oh my God, there are no rules. I don't know where a song will come or when. But it's always right on the money, and it's always where it needs to be in a musical, which is when the when when the human emotion and when the human significance of what's happening is so great, words no longer do it justice. Did they? Now, I watched the. I told you I watched the director's cut on Amazon Prime. Did they release the director's cut to DVD? Oh yeah, it's been released on DVD and Blu-ray. I think several times now. Okay, that's good because I know, I know I've heard for years Jack Warner could be stubborn. So. Well, thank thank goodness Jack Warner's a, a little cold right now, so I don't think he'll notice. <laughs> uh, and 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 the 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 number of cool cool conservative men, or maybe it's cool cool considerate men, one or the other. Cool men is if you direct the show is what it's called. Uh, is actually something that rounds out and humanizes the conservatives. So by taking it out, it works against the ends that Jack Warner wanted. It does. I think if there are some things in a musicals you just don't take out, like I, I'll give you an example. I remember when they were discussing remaking the Lion King in the, into a live action and Scar has this, this in the in the anime scar has this this so this solo where he's sinning and they wanted it taken out and i'm thinking don't take that out that's important because he's telling the he's telling the hyenas hey some of you may die but it's it's worth it <laughs> it's yeah like, it's it's important to me so when they're that if they would have had that out i feel you're missing something in that movie if you get a chance to see the cut version, yeah. it's really interesting to watch. Uh, you know, and keep in mind that for decades, if people wanted to see the full uncut 1776, maybe this was a good thing. They had to see it live. Do you think somebody will show this on TV over the weekend? You would think they oh, would. Oh, I'm sure Turner Classic Movies or say it gets it gets streamed a lot. Uh, so I, I think it's, it's one of those things like a Christmas story that, you know, that just gets associated with its holiday. Um, I haven't checked it out, but I'm, oh, I'm sure it will, you know, because you got a short list of movies that really work and are, you know, you got the Patriot and this, yeah. 
Uh, and I'm sure there's something else I'm forgetting, but but these know, are the ones. Well, I know it's not, you know, about American independence, but Braveheart is a really great movie. Braveheart is a great movie, and it stars, uh, as, well, I say stars, it features Patrick McGowan in uh, in one of his last great performances as Longshanks, a.k.a. The Prisoner. Yeah. Um, now, uh, some uh, an interesting bit of David Ford trivia. David Ford was with the production for a long time, and he didn't just play John Hancock. Uh, of course, his his Martha Jefferson was legendary, but uh, no, no, he didn't play Martha Jefferson. Just imagine, just imagine. Uh, but he did play also uh, Dickinson at one point when the actor playing Dickinson left the show, and a friend of mine, Gregory Mank, who's the the horror historian, um, does commentaries on some of the Universal discs and things like that. Um, Greg Mank is a great theater goer and a huge fan of 1776. Greg and I have spent hours talking about this show because it's that kind of show. It just inspires that weird loyalty. And uh, now that I'm done name dropping, Greg said that he saw David Ford as Dickinson and said not only was he even better than he was as uh, Hancock, you know, now playing the main villain of the play, but it was it was probably one of the best Dickinsons he's ever seen. And I think Greg's been in the show also. Wow. That's cool. That's cool as hell. Who's your who was your favorite actor in this movie? Wow. You know, what an embarrassment of riches. Um I gotta go ultimately with William Daniels. Um oh. And, you know, one of the cool things about about William Daniels, the only person to win a Tony out of this thing was not William Daniels. It was Ron Holgate, who plays uh, uh, Richard Henry Lee, who my mother always said I was a, a direct descendant of. Um, and I don't know if that's true, but print the legend. Um, the, the wild Southerner who yeah. is charismatic enough to introduce independence and has one of the ma- first major... Uh, numbers in the movie and a very fun movie. He's a body character. Ron Holgate also originated the part of Milois Gloriosus in uh, the original funny thing happened on the way to the forum. But uh, Holgate was the guy who got the Tony reason was it's really interesting when they listed the cast in the program, they listed them all as an ensemble. That's also how they took their curtain call (coughs) all at once. Well, at the time, and maybe still, I believe the the Tonys recognized and categorized performers by, I don't remember if it's whether how they appeared in the curtain call or how they appeared in the program. But because it was all done as one ensemble, no one could be recognized really as best actor right. in a musical. So uh, when it looked like you know, William Daniels was going to walk away with best supporting actor. Daniels said, you know what? And Daniels, one of those fair people on the planet or fairest people on the planet. I think he's the president of the screen actors guild. Uh, certainly he was at one point, just a cool guy. And Daniels said, I wasn't a supporting actor and I'm not going to take away a supporting actor role because of how the program or curtain call were done. And so he withdrew uh, you know, or, or refused or something like that. And so it went to Ron Holgate, who legitimately was. Um, I think Daniels does, I think Daniels puts in an Olivier in Hamlet or Henry V level performance. He manages to be certainly obnoxious and disliked, dashing, romantic, funny, brainy, irate, hugely heartbreakingly sympathetic mm-hmm. and and at the same time just a jerk and and he he handles every single note of that no no pun intended he handles every single note of that with such precision of course he'd been playing the part for a few years on broadway so he had a lot of practice but what a difficult role to pull off of course he had the best partner in the world which was Sherman Edwards and Sherman <laughs> Edwards script 
and uh, Sherman Edwards music and lyrics. Um, God, I think it's Sherman Edwards script. I think it's for Sherman. Yeah, sure. <laughs> yeah. I think it was Sherman Edwards. Yeah, I got to go with William Daniels too. He he's just amazing. I remember the first time I ever saw him in was Boy Meets World. And oh, you you're a young 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 fella. Yeah. <laughs> That's the first thing I ever saw him in. And my mom said, he's been in a lot of things. And I'm like, what do you mean he's been in a lot of things? Well, he gets typecast as a fussy authority figure. And I think, you know, there is some of that. But you want a Dark Shadows connection. In the episode of Galactica 1980, which I think is called Night of the Cylons, William Daniels, appears as a harried Halloween party goer with Roger Davis as a human Cylon in the back seat and Laura Parker dressed up like Elvira as his wife going with him to the party. Nice. Uh, uh, He also uh, plays a, a hipster Republican dad in the astounding uh, 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 James Coburn movie, The President's Analyst. But the first time I saw him was he was on the TV show St. Elsewhere, where he was playing a you know New England fuss budget. But at the same time, he was playing a digital fuss budget as the voice of Kit yeah. on Knight Rider. And one of the many bad decisions that they made in the Knight Rider remake was not getting the one truly ageless member of the ensemble back. I mean, God love Val Kilmer, nothing against him, but he's no William Daniels. Um, and, uh, and Daniels really humanized that part. And I think plays the, the greatest AI ever in, in, in film history. Uh, the only problem is, is that the scripts to Knight Rider never really gave Kit enough to do and never provided Kit with the sort of content. I know that sounds ludicrous, but we live in a post new Battlestar Galactica era. Never gave Kit really the the chances to tackle problems that uh, he might have he might have had. Yeah. No, you're right. Def- I remember watching Knight Rider after watching Boy Meets World and I'm thinking they're not really giving William Daniels much to do other than talk. No, I mean, he's great, you know, giving catty quips. He, he basically is Higgins yeah. for Magnum P.I., but just shoved into the, you know, the dashboard of a car. Uh, and, of course, John Hillerman and William Daniels look a lot alike. Just just ima- imagine if Orson Welles hadn't passed away, because he was originally supposed to be the, the billionaire in Magnum P.I., he was. He also would have been amazing as Michael Knight. Yeah. Imagine him lumbering out of the car and the car kind of sagging and, and you know, sparks flying as it's, you know, driving, sort of going at the speed of a golf cart. I shouldn't make a fat joke, but it's Orson Welles. It's Hollywood tradition. Uh, uh, but yeah, that's a, that's, but you know, now here's the thing that they could have done with Knight Rider though is have a brilliant hero who was somewhat mobility impaired, yeah. but then you put him in kit and the two of them combined uh, are liberated. Yeah. That's an interesting thought. In a, in a way, Robocop is going to be where they this guy gets his arms and legs blowed off. And, they, and you know, have, I'm sure you said Have you Googled Ro- Robocop fan remake scene 27? No, no. Well, kids, don't do it around your parents. (laughs) I really, really mean it. Um, More profoundly NC-17 than anything that could could possibly exist. But it's satire. I mean, it is satire, but Uh, you will uh, you will you will have your legs crossed for a long time. <laughs> Happy Fourth of July, kids! There's some fireworks for you. Oh my god! What's your What's your favorite Fourth of July movie, though? <clears throat> I 
I would say this or Independence Day. I I love Independence Day. It's a good movie. I got to go with Jaws. It's the perfect Fourth of July movie. Oh well, yeah. If you want to consider that a Fourth of July movie, I would never contradict you. And Jaws is one of the greatest films ever made. Uh, and you know the thing about Jaws that people kind of forget because it does everything it sets out to do so well, but in its heart, Jaws is a horror movie. Yeah. It is. And, and it gets forgotten as a horror movie. I said, my God, it's a tremendous horror movie. But it has a happy ending. They triumph over the monster. And, uh, and it, of course, it's, it has, it's all based in reality. So it's hard to think of as a horror movie, but I think it does as a horror movie. It's a really great suspense horror movie, too. Mm-hmm. That's, oh. that's, a, that's another category it belongs in, too. Yeah. And... Again, great acting, Roy Schreider, you know, the cast is excellent. But is there anything you want to add about 1776? Uh, If you haven't seen it, you are in for such a treat. And there are drinking games based on 1776. It is uh, one of the most infectiously quotable movies ever and it is because it was made by the people who made the broadway play it is unbelievably faithful to what you would have seen on broadway um with the exception of a few little things that they actually add here and there i think fire wagon and stuff like that it's uh it's precisely what you would have seen in new york but with lavish production values and a guy who looks like Bill Murray wandering around in the background. One of the guys from the South looks like Bill Murray. It's a great way to learn history. Um, I think it's, I have five musicals that I would, uh, if I could just keep in rotation and do one every five years. And 1776 is definitely one of them. 1776, Fiddler on the Roof, Wizard of Oz is really good. It is good. It is a great, one of the greatest musicals. Paint Your Wagon is a great Western musical. Josh too. Logan. You know how you do Josh Logan choreography? I'll show you. I'll show you right now. This is how you do Josh Logan choreography. You have a song, and you have people just stomp up and down, which that's a show even I can choreograph. I know people who love Paint Your Wagon. I need to do it eventually. Yeah. I'm going to guess the per- the character you played. In the- I'm going to okay. go John Adams. Oh, no, 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 no. No, this was uh, this was a production uh, uh, at, at, a, at a high school. And, um, and I had to kind of fill in some blanks. So I was a support figure. I played Dr. Lyman Hall of Georgia. Oh, okay. Cool. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, really one of probably my two best performers I've ever I've ever had the pleasure of teaching. A guy named Brad Love played John Adams, and uh, and then later uh, one of one of the okay I'll say one of the three most extraordinary performers I've ever worked with. A guy named Alec Lee played it the second time I directed it, uh, but I remember I was so proud of him that on the last night. Because Adams had suffered so much when Hall comes in and he has that lovely little speech about, you know, a guy not only has to vote his conscience and all of that. Uh, Before I said Georgia votes yay, this was just where the two of them were alone. I gave him a big hug. And that was a that was a that's, you know, you know, you never get that moment as a director very often. But uh, that was a that was really good. And Brad just worked his butt off. And so did Alec uh, years later. Cool. That's really cool. For Patrick McCray, I'm resident of Call It. Link to the Dark Shadows Daybook where you can go get it on Amazon will be in the description box. Definitely, definitely go check out 1776. A wonderful, beautiful, yeah. beautiful movie to watch. I was, again, I was impressed with it from start to finish. It had my attention. I literally forgot, <laughs> left my washer in the washer. It did not change until that movie ended. <laughs> it's a, you know, it just, it just pulled you right in. 
It does. It really does. Patrick, man, first of all, happy Independence Day to happy you. Happy Independence Day to you, too. And have a safe and happy 4th of July, man. You, too. God bless. Bye. Bye.